Spencer are going to tell us about fun with closed circuit cameras. Thank you. Um, so I'm Joshua Schroeder. Uh, today we'll be talking about CCTV systems, setup, attack vectors, and also uh, laws about what you should keep in mind. This is I'm Spencer Brooks. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I have about 10 years of security experience. I have a master's degree from UNC Charlotte in uh, security and privacy, where I was the founder of the 49th Security Division. Um, I also have uh, a lot of experience in web penetration testing, and then also have done some R&D work for both the Navy and Air Force. Um, the other thing I want to mention is I'm part of Nova Hackers here in Washington, D.C., so I, um, you know, work with them and, uh, you know, do talks there regularly. Um, I also want to thank my parents for coming up from North Carolina to see the talk, and I'll pass it over to Spencer Brooks to introduce himself. As you guys can see, um, more of the novice of the group. I'm just here to uh, mainly provide my moral support for Josh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in the tech world, so that's what kind of got me into this. And uh, Josh has been a great friend to help sh shed some light on it. I've been to Nova Hackers meeting, all a great group of people. And I'd also like to uh, thank my girlfriend who's here, back there recording me. Uh, and this is my first security conference ever. So, you know, take it easy on me, please. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, please don't hack my phone or my Twitter, you know, all that stuff. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you'll, I'll get into what exactly I'm wearing, uh, which is what we designed a little bit later. So essentially, the month, uh, three of the main goals that we wanted to cover while we presented this topic to you guys is one, you know, what different types of cameras are there that are out there, and to give you guys some tips on how to identify them. Uh, two, learn how to disable them, but more importantly, how you can protect yourself and your system from being disabled. And then, you know, the three, the laws and procedure. Now, it's up there on the screens, but we also want to verbally say that we are not lawyers or judges. You know, don't use our advice in court. Um, and also, this is our own opinions, so don't ask us where we work. <laughs> uh, basically, for a real basic system, obviously, you need the DVR, the storage system for your uh, cameras to feed it to, and you'll need the cameras. Uh, we suggest at least two, because you want to have one camera that's watching your asset, but you also want a camera that watches the camera that watches the asset. And the reason for that being, if someone were to come in and see your safe, and then they see your camera, and they knock it out, but then, oh, there's a camera that's watching them knock it out, right? Um, of course, you need the uh, cable to plug it in to the wall to make sure it operates and uh, the cables and the mounting tools. So that's just a real high-level basic CCTV system. Now, in terms of different types of cameras, you know, they have the, uh, the IP camera where you can tell by the antenna, so it's uh, feeding, it's wireless. Um, you can tell for an outdoor LED camera by the little uh, lights that are around the lens, so that's a nighttime recording. Uh, indoor dome is one of the more tricky ones because it's covered and it's hard to tell which angle uh, and which direction the, the camera is pointing in. Some more types um, we, we saw in our research, the fake cameras. And generally, we saw that these were fake by the way that generally you need two cords running into the camera. You need one for power and then one for the data. But if there's only one cord, then it's generally just the power and you can tell that it's fake. Uh, the CCTV, IP cameras, I'm sure this is all very high level information you guys are aware of. And during the search, we found also a few novelty cameras, the, the hidden types. And these are a little bit harder to discover because they are hidden. Um, but these are just some that are out there. The sprinkler and the clock and the statue. Other types of cameras that are not necessarily CCTV but can be included in this realm. As you see on the screen, uh, like Xbox, PlayStation, um, the laptop cameras, cell phones. But there's an interesting fact about the gaming console uh, cameras that we like to discuss. Yeah, so when I was at DerbyCon, I was at the bar talking to a friend of mine, and we started talking about what they're trying to do with the Kinect. Uh, so basically, they're, they're, you know, they're recording you when you're in your, your room and you're watching TV or you're playing a game. So one thing that we thought about was, well, what about all the MMA fights and all the sporting events where you pay like $60 or you know, a premium cable package? So what we were thinking they might do is, if you have three people in the room, 
they might charge the tickets for each person in the room and verify that there's only three people in the room based on using the connect. If a fourth person comes into the room, the feed might actually stop and you might have to confirm that you want to pay for the fourth ticket. So that's not anything official from Microsoft, but it's just a theory that we have on these kind of camera systems and the way that they're tracking you. The other thing that we thought about was with all the information that they're getting from your home, you know, gaming system, they could be tracking demographics. So whether you're white, black, Asian, male, female, who's watching that? And producers of games and also uh, movies would like to know that as well so that they can target their audience and get more people watching it. So those are just some thoughts that we had. So another thing that um, basically started me looking at this was when I went with my dad after I graduated high school to CES. Uh, that's basically the consumer electronics show that takes place every year in Las Vegas and it just wrapped up this past week. So one of the things that's there is you'll notice that there's like Samsung and Sony and a lot of different manufacturers that you think of for like big TVs and phones and, and various different things like that. Well they actually make CCTV systems too, or at least they used to. Um, so what you can do is you can go there and you can talk to the vendors and see the systems that they have, uh, kind of like the, the hidden ones that we were able to show just a few minutes ago. And you can basically see how well they work without spending hundreds and thousands of dollars on various different systems. And for a hundred dollar ticket entry, that makes it really economical for you to just fly out there, try it out, see what's going to work best for you, and then purchase that system later on. So we've picked a few systems uh, off of the internet. Uh, these two systems here are off of Newegg. Uh, so you can see there's the um, Night Owl one, which I haven't actually used either of these systems, but I've used the software that they have. So Night Owl has a really cool app that you can put on your phone, and then you can basically VPN into your apartment or business, um, and you'll be able to get the video feeds right on your phone and see what's going on. Now you'll notice that they have the tagline LTE there. That doesn't mean that it actually streams over LTE. It's just a clever marketing term to make it look, you know, more attractive to you, the, the customer. Um, the other one here is the uh, Komodo, uh, or, I'm sorry, the KGuard one, and uh, that's also a very high rated one uh, that you might want to consider as well. Okay, um, so the other one we have here is the Swan one. This one was uh, seen on Amazon. Swan is a very high level uh, camera system if you're wanting to have a lot of precision and get a lot of detail out of the uh, video feeds that you have. Uh, we actually were just at Micro Center, uh, which is a, a warehouse of uh, electronic goods here, and uh, we were looking at the different versions they have, and they are still you know, one of the top vendors uh, for this. Um, if you're on a more of a budget level, we uh, have one here that's just under $200 as well. Um, so uh, when I was first getting a CCTV system, the major thing that I w also wanted to look at was the attack vectors. Um, now we're at ShmooCon, so our goal here is to build things. Um, but you can't always build things without thinking about how one someone might take down your system. Uh, so the first thing we looked at was for the wireless CCTV systems, they could be jammed. And so you could basically just get a jammer off of eBay with uh, the 2.4 or 5 gigahertz range of whatever you're trying to attack and it would basically close out the camera signals and you could move in and do what you need to do. Um, the other type was uh, some of the research I did with some other students at the university. When they got their systems, we noticed that a lot of the web consoles might have a backdoor um, like a root that would have no password, um, even though in the admin panel it would show like admin and then user one, um, and it wouldn't allow you to easily change those and you could get into the system and do some nasty things. Um, the other option was is going in through Telnet. Um, a lot of systems actually have a thing where you can just hit the Telnet interface and you get root access. Uh, let's see. Oh, so uh, for the wires, um, when we did select those, you want to make sure that you use correct conduit uh, because that will prevent someone from cutting that. Uh, so like a metal conduit to protect it from, from pliers and things like that. Um, and then also man in the middle attack. Uh, for some of the systems that I've deployed at different businesses with the IP cameras, they don't have a lot of um, server technology on there, so they don't deploy HTTPS because it would make it slower. And so you can just use a man-in-the-middle attack and get the HTTP uh, raw traffic off of that. 
Um, so the last thing that we looked at was something from uh, hackandmod.com using infrared LEDs. So infrared LEDs, if you don't know, they're those things that basically uh, your remote to your TV is using in order to communicate and turn the TV on and change channels. So you don't see that light. But if you point it at a camera, the camera picks up on that light and it basically becomes blinded. So I don't know how well this is going to work. But um, I'm going to explain a little bit about the design and how we changed it. And then we'll go ahead and show a, a quick demo here. So on Hack and Mod, what he used was uh, parallel, uh, which just means that you have to have a lot of wires in order to basically connect a 9-volt battery to the 6 or, or 8 LEDs that you have. Um, so my dad's an electrical engineer, and so I got with him, and we basically redesigned it to use series. So now you can see there's only one wire. So that makes it a lot more comfortable and a lot less uh, points of breakage are, are there. So um, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to a camera that I have on my laptop, and Spencer's going to go ahead and put on this, um, this hoodie that we've put together. So very we've, inconspicuous hoodie. Very inconspicuous hoodie. <laughs> we actually have a switch right here, so he can turn it on. So it's a little difficult to see, but you can, you can see that the light is actually hitting the camera and causing his face to be a little bit distorted. Um, now this granted... very bright. Yeah. Right, this is, this is yeah. most ideal for like nighttime situations involving the outdoor um, infrared cameras. Right, so we've got bright lights on us right now, so we might as well be outside, so. <laughs> but anyways, moving on, uh, this is pretty much what we've done. If you guys want to talk about this later, we can move on more, we only have. So uh, like I said, uh, this is the picture of, I'm sorry, th this is the picture of what uh, was done on the website and this is where we move towards. Um, so uh, going back to the actual setup, uh, now that we've talked about the attack vectors, um, this is the actual system that I put together. Uh, it was uh, bought off of eBay back in 2010. I got it for about $711, which was a good price at the time, but as you can see, they've come down quite a bit. It had 16 camera hookup, um, and I was uh, given five cameras in the package that I got, and we basically you know, put them around our apartment, and it, it actually worked fairly well. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to do was we wanted to do off-site backup. And so that was a feature that we added, uh, you know, that we were looking for, but when we tried it out, it didn't work so well. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but they actually included a Windows application that allowed you to log in to it, and then you could do various different things with that. So, um, since the offsite was failing, I basically um, set it up, as you can see here, you can see all the different screens coming through, and I set up motion detecting for the different doors and window areas that we would be monitoring. And what it would do is it would, anytime there was motion, it would capture that, save it to a AVC file, and then we could use a, another tool in order to FTP that to my shared hosting site. The only problem with that was after a while, I got about 16,000 files on there, and I started getting complaints from them about them degrading the shared hosting site. So I switched to Dropbox, but of course with four college students coming in and out and we're watching TV and doing things in the living room and stuff, um, it filled up really fast. So in the free version of Dropbox, if you don't know, it's only two gigabytes, and so in about a week it was full. Um, thankfully, uh, when Box.net came out, they were having a promo of 50 gigabytes, um, so I hopped on that and grabbed it. At first they didn't have a very good sync tool, uh, but later, when I was playing around with it more, they had improved it well enough that we were able to actually get the point of coming in our front door, getting motion detection, having it drop to disk, and put in the box.net folder, and then uploading it was all done within seven seconds. And since we had it in a closet, I felt that that was a good enough, you know, time frame that we could basically go through and, you know, save ourselves from someone actually coming in, grabbing the DVR, and losing all the video camera feeds. Um, so the next thing that we also did, um, sorry, I forgot this a little bit, was we also had to do a script that would take all the metadata because the DVR was kind of noisy, and so we just basically stripped all that out so it would save some of the space. Um, and then also in the future, we'll talk about the laws a little bit more, but uh, we want to use GPG encryption in order to prevent someone from getting that when it's hosted on the cloud. 
So I'll now let Spencer talk a little bit about the laws and how we uh, predicted that. And before I get into that, I just wanted to highlight again that this jacket is uh, powered by four batteries in the back uh, with a switch in the front. So it's, you know, it's fairly, uh, like I said, inconspicuous <laughs> until you put the hood up. Um, but it, as you guys are, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, Aaron Hernandez, who uh, was an NFL player who allegedly killed uh, one of his friends um, and then had his place scrubbed clean and surveillance cameras destroyed and his cell phone given to the cops of pieces. But, you know, innocent until proven guilty. Uh, with that being said, <laughs> with that being said, you know, it's important to know when you set up a CCTV system, how a CCTV system, how it can help you, but how also um, you can be uh, also liable to provide that to the, uh, to the law enforcement. So part of this is that we wanted to, you know, relate to you guys exactly what were the laws, and again, this is, you know, just our interpretation of the law, so you have to do your own research, um, in terms of recording. So we found a lot of laws regarding wiretapping, which is the audio portion of your CCTV. So um, essentially, varying by state, it depends whether or not all of the parties involved that's speaking has to be consenting to the recording of the audio, or if it's just one party consent, and that we'll break that down in the next slide. But in terms of the video, there really hasn't been a lot of man or laws that relate to um, recording people as long as it is in a reason, there is no reasonable expectation of privacy. So with that being said, if you have a camera that's recording the uh, outside of your building pointed towards the street, someone cannot expect that to be private, which is how Google Street View works, essentially. But you cannot have a camera pointing to someone's living room or bathroom because that's pretty uh, understandable that they expect themselves to be private in that uh, environment. So again, like I said, it breaks down and it varies from state to state. As you can see, in D.C., only one party has to consent. So essentially that means that as long as you yourself, who was recording the conversation between you and another party, consent to that recording, everything is green. But if you were to just uh, you know, cross the bridge or cross 16th or whatever into Maryland, you have to say this conversation is going to be recorded, and if people then continue talking after that point, it's essentially them providing their consent. Otherwise, it uh, is illegal, and that goes into the wiretapping laws. Uh, but in Virginia and Tennessee, it goes back to that one party. Now, the one party can then be a little tricky. If you are paying for the telephone bill, and it's at your residence, but the conversation is between two other people, because you're the one who's paying the bill, then essentially you are privy to the use of that landline. Um, but again, before you get into recording other people's conversations, do a little bit more research. Um, but with that being said, it's you know, very unique that as long as it's not reasonable expectation of privacy, uh, the video, recording video has not necessarily been brought up a lot in laws. So um, I can't remember if we said this earlier, but um, one of the things that I did when I was in college was I was part of the scholarship for service, and uh, one of the things that they did is they brought in a presenter who was a ninth court district judge from North Carolina. And so we actually spent about two and a half hours talking to him about these different things, and that's kind of like where we got a lot of the basis for this talk. Um, and one of the things that he was saying was, is if you do want to record audio, make sure that it's separate. Um, so that when you submit it to court, basically your audio is one piece of evidence and your video is another piece of evidence. And then if they decide to throw out the wire, you know, the, the audio under the wiretapping laws um, and not getting a correct warrant for that, then you at least have your video as well. Um, so what we went ahead and did is we just basically um, cut the audio and we're like, we're not going to deal with that. We're just going to put up the signs um, so that there's no expectation of privacy, and then we won't, we won't deal with the, uh, the audio thing. Um, when I presented this at Nova Hackers, uh, we had a gentleman come in who was a private investigator. Um, this was probably about six to eight months ago. He confirmed that that is also, you know, in the current state of laws, the, the way that you should go as well. Uh, don't record the audio, just record the video. Um, the other thing we want to, you know, make sure that you're aware of is that if you have people that would be 
in your apartment or home that could be, you know, say, walking from the bathroom to the kitchen and they don't put clothes on, it's a felony to record someone without their permission and or, you know, serious consent um, if they're, you know, naked in, in that video. So you could be facing a felony just by having a CCTV system and not using the correct signage um, and, and someone oh, I didn't realize there was cameras, and now you're facing up to five years in prison because of that. Um, the other thing, uh, sensitive thing to look at is if you guys have children, or you have friends that would have children that would be coming over, I mean, you've got toddlers, they, you know, they might take their clothes off for some reason, and you have child pornography essentially on your DVR, and that is a s extreme problem. So what we recommend for that is basically what you do is you take your cameras and you increase the height of where they're going to be. So in other words, like if your door is eight feet, only record maybe the like five to eight feet of that door. Um, and then same thing with recording windows and other places of entry. Um, it'll basically, you know, protect you from having that, you know, risk. Um, and, and delete that, you know, if it does happen immediately. Um, so another thing to think about, and this is something we talked about with the judge, is uh, data in rest and data in motion. So going back to the wiretapping, that's basically data in motion. It's a lot harder for people to get a hold of that um, in, in a law enforcement standpoint. So you know they'd have to go through the you know FBI's guidelines for wiretapping. Um, whereas if it's a DVR, all they have to do is basically write in the warrant. I need the um, you know, the, the hard drive with the, the DVR content and I need to subpoena that or they could say I'm going to take your whole CCTV system. And if it's written in the warrant that way, they can come in, grab it, no problem, no questions asked. Um, so that's uh, another thing to think about when you're doing the off-site recording and that's why I want to do the GPG encryption um, is because they can essentially go to the third party without your consent and knowledge and basically grab your DVR information and they have it and they're preparing something in court against you uh, and you would not have any knowledge of that. Um, so like we've talked about, we have the um, one party consent law. Um, you know, that's a, that's a big thing to think about when you're doing this. So just make sure that you have the correct signs up. There's a lot of templates online that you can get for free. Um, if you're buying a DVR system, sometimes you can get them to throw those in for free and you can just put those up. That helps you so much in court. And the real big thing is when you have a TV or CCTV system, what is your end goal? To catch someone doing something wrong at your establishment. If you can't use that later on, then it's essentially pointless and you've basically wasted your money. Um, and then, um, you know, basically that's, that's pretty much it. So. Um, does anybody have any questions, or did you have any extra comments for that? So, okay. Oh, we have a question in the front row. So, if a robber is naked and doing the worm underneath... <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure he has. Oh, well. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, so, the question was, if a robber is naked and he's doing the worm under your CCTV system, he's pretty much covered all his bases because now you're recording a nude person without consent. So, yes, it would make things a little more complicated um, and then you would, have to, you would have to submit the evidence and it probably wouldn't be able to be seen as, you know, as easily as if it was clothed robber. Yes, you can solve that problem by putting up signs, but there's always interpretations of laws. And you can see this in different, you know, situations. There's a lot of gray areas, and um, you have to have a law put in place, then you have the gray area, and then you have to have a court case in order to see how they're going to rule on that law. And so basically, you know, we've looked at some of these, and some of them go either way. Um, so it's kind of, you know, dependent on the, uh, you know, situation. And that's one thing that one of my professors would always say. In a legal situation, the biggest thing is it depends. I guess I'd just also like to quickly add, I don't think he has that reasonable expectation of privacy after he broke into the house. Yeah. <laughs>
Right, so uh, the question was, a lot of cameras do have infrared protection, is that correct? Okay, uh, yes, we actually were at Micro Center uh, about three days ago and we were looking at some of the cameras and they actually do have protection against the infrared stuff. Um, it really depends on the camera and the age of the camera. Um, you'll have a lot of establishments, like you know, you have older shopping centers like Walmart's that they probably will not have changed their cameras out. Uh, you'll have cheaper like gas stations and things where they don't have the money and resources because they're on a very fixed budget, so they won't be able to buy those cameras. So yeah, you're hitting those kind of situations. But yes, there are cameras now that do filter out the infrared light and basically make this attack null. So good question. I'm sorry? Uh, the question was, does ultraviolet LEDs do anything? Uh, we looked at those, but we did not test those. Uh, so I can't actually comment on how they would work. Um, but my guess would be is they would not really do anything for you. So oh, we have a gentleman here that's shaking his head no. And he, he's tried them and says they do not work. So <laughs> I'll take his word for it. <laughs> I think also part of our research was that they're pretty visible, so part of the idea is to be inconspicuous. Um, these are a little bit slightly less easy to detect by the uh, human eye, um, so that would kind of give us away as we walk in. Yeah. One interesting thing is um, it, these basically work at, um, I believe it is 850 mega, uh, Manometers. Um, and then there are other ones that as you change the wavelength of light, they become less and less effective. So, you know, what, what you see on the camera, you know, is varied by that. And so we picked, we made sure that we got the 850 because there are some that are labeled as infrared that are at 980 and they're not actually true infrared. Another thing that we looked at was a lot of times when a camera is focusing um, after it has the, um, the IR filter, for example, having a system that would oscillate the lights so that if it was fast enough, maybe the camera just kept on trying to focus and then that would be a different attack vector. But that takes um, a, a little bit more of the R&D. Uh, maybe next year we'll talk about that. <laughs> All right, uh, they're calling us to get off stage, so um, thank you for your support and hope you have your